This is the land of Havilah, Second Chronicles 32. In the last verse of the last chapter, Hezekiah sought God with all his heart, and guess what? He prospered. But turning our attention now northward to Samaria, which was the capital city of the northern kingdom, 46 miles north of Jerusalem, we know from 2 Kings that the Assyrian mega-kingdom besieged Samaria in Hezekiah's fourth year. After three years, the siege was successful, and that was the final end of the northern kingdom. And Jerusalem seems to be next in line. In Hezekiah's 14th year, verse 1, After these things and this faithfulness, comment Hezekiah has been faithful, still in verse 1, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came, entered into Judah, and encamped against the fortified cities, and intended to win them for himself. When Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come, and that he was planning to fight against Jerusalem, he took counsel with his princes and his mighty men to stop the waters of the springs which were outside of the city, and they helped him. So many people gathered together, and they stopped all the springs and the brook that flowed through the middle of the land, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find abundant water? He took courage, built up all the wall that was broken down, and raised it up to the towers with the other wall outside, and strengthened Millo in David's city, and made weapons and shields in abundance. He set the captains of war over the people and gathered them together to him in the wide place at the gate of the city and spoke encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Don't be afraid or dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude who is with him, for there is a greater one with us than with him. An arm of flesh is with him, but Yahweh our God is with us to help us and to fight our battles." The people rested themselves on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. Comment verses 1 through 8, Hezekiah and little Judah bravely prepared themselves for the Assyrian siege. No doubt they heard horror stories about starvation and the siege of Samaria. With regard to the Assyrian attack on Judah and Jerusalem, we'll borrow from chapters 18 and 19 of 2 Kings and 36 and 37 of Isaiah, which are much more detailed. In verse 1, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, encamped against the fortified cities of Judah, it says, but it was worse than that. He, quote, took them, end quote. So it's looking bleak for Jerusalem. No doubt Hezekiah ordered food to be stored in the city, and in verses 3 and 4, he stopped the springs outside the city, so at least when the Assyrians came, they'd have to haul in their own water. Second King adds details that he created a conduit into the city and a pool in the city. Today we can go on the internet and see photos of Hezekiah's underground conduit, or at least it's credited to Hezekiah, is cut from pure rock and is about four feet wide and six feet high. In verses 7 and 8, he encouraged the people. The Assyrians have a strong arm, he said, but no problem, we've got Yahweh. In verse 8, quote, the people rested themselves on the words of Hezekiah, end quote. That was a beautiful thing. We need to rest ourselves today in our God and on his word, because unrest of the mind is the opposite of faith. There's no room for pessimism, fear, panic, because Yahweh's still on his throne. All those things are the opposite of faith, and without faith it's impossible to please God, Hebrews 11:6. Not to mention, without faith, we get no rest. It was a lot of work to get the city prepared, to dig the conduit through rock and such. So we see how faith motivates work. If we think God will bless our work, we work. Verse 9. After this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem. Now he was before Lachish and all his power with him. To Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all Judah who were at Jerusalem. Come at Sennacherib was with his army at Lachish, laying siege, which was in Judah about 26 miles southwest of Jerusalem. He sent messengers to Jerusalem who came stood outside the wall and yelled up the following to Hezekiah's ambassadors trying to shake their faith. Still in verse 9, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, In whom do you trust that you remain under siege in Jerusalem? Doesn't Hezekiah persuade you to give you over to die by famine and by thirst, saying, Yahweh our God will deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Hasn't the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars? 
and commanded Judah and Jerusalem, saying, You shall worship before one altar, and you shall burn incense on it. Comment. They say, Go ahead and surrender already. If we come here and lay siege, you'll either starve or thirst to death. Don't think Yahweh will help you. He's angry with you. Didn't Hezekiah destroy all Yahweh's high places and insult him by leaving him with only one altar? They went on delivering Sennacherib's message, verse 13. Don't you know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of the lands? Were the gods of the nations of the lands in any way able to deliver their land out of my hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations which my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of my hand? That your God should be able to deliver you out of my hand. Now therefore, don't let Hezekiah deceive you nor persuade you in this way. Don't believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of my hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you out of my hand? Comment, Sennacherib's message is, Everywhere I go and everywhere the Assyrian kings before me have gone, we conquer. No God of any nation has been able to protect his nation from us. Verse 16, His servant spoke yet more against Yahweh God and against his servant Hezekiah. Comment, Sennacherib's messengers finished reading the message and added some insults of their own against Yahweh. When they left, they returned to Sennacherib and gave him the report that the message got no response. But it got no response because Hezekiah told them to make no response. Sennacherib must have thought it was some kind of mistake that they wouldn't respond, so he wrote the following to Hezekiah, verse 17. He also wrote letters insulting Yahweh, the God of Israel, and speaking against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of the lands, which have not delivered the people out of my hand, so shall the God of Hezekiah not deliver his people out of my hand. Comment, it was the same as what the messengers had said. Now speaking again of the messengers when they came, verse 18, they called out with a loud voice in the Jews' language to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them and to trouble them that they might take the city. They spoke of the God of Jerusalem as of the gods of the peoples of the earth, which are the works of men's hands. Come on, they spoke about Yahweh, creator of heaven and earth, like he was an idol that man created. Coming up, Isaiah lived in Jerusalem and helped Hezekiah by delivering the word of Yahweh to him. Verse 20. Hezekiah the king and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, prayed because of this and cried to heaven. Come on, Hezekiah and Isaiah prayed, and it's not here, but Isaiah delivered a long prophecy that Sennacherib would go home and die by the sword and that his army wouldn't come to Jerusalem but leave the same way they came. Less than 24 hours later during the night, verse 21, Yahweh sent an angel who cut off all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned with shame of face to his own land. When he had come into the house of his God, those who came out of his own bowels killed him there with the sword. Comment. There's much more detail about that in 2 Kings and in Isaiah. As the next day was dawning after Isaiah delivered the prophecy, 185,000 Assyrian soldiers simply didn't wake up. They died during the night, 2 Kings 19.35. It was obvious to the Assyrians that Yahweh had attacked them, so they went home. Eventually, word of what happened spread to distant nations. But in the meantime, in verse 21, Sennacherib went home, where some of his offspring, as, as prophesied by Isaiah, killed him in a temple. It was by some who, quote, came out of his own bowels, end quote. Secular history confirms each of these details that two of Sennacherib's sons attacked him and killed him at a temple in Nineveh. Nineveh was one of the principal home cities of the Assyrian kingdom, and it's now Mosul, Iraq. Verse 22. Thus Yahweh saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. Comment. Kings in distant lands were so impressed with what happened, that verse 23. Many brought gifts to Yahweh to Jerusalem and precious things to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations from then on. Comment, moving on to another event, verse 24. In those days, Hezekiah was terminally ill, and he prayed to Yahweh, and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. Comment, from 2 Kings 20 and Isaiah 38, Hezekiah was sick to the point of death with a boil. 
Since he was so sick, the infection had likely spread to his bloodstream, which is what we now call septicemia or septic shock. Isaiah told Hezekiah the word of the Lord that indeed it would be fatal. But Hezekiah prayed with tears, and before Isaiah got home, he turned right around, returned to the palace, and told Hezekiah from the Lord that he would be healed and live 15 more years, during which time Yahweh would continue to keep the city safe from the Assyrians. As a sign that all this would happen, Isaiah said the shadow on the steps would go backward 10 steps, or it's also translated backward by 10 marks on the sundial. Indeed, the shadow did go backward, as Isaiah predicted, and Hezekiah was well enough in three days, as Isaiah also predicted, to go to the temple. So Yahweh gave Hezekiah the immediate sign of the shadow and the sign three days later of the recovery to confirm that A, he would live 15 more years, and B, the Assyrians wouldn't come back. Coming up, given Yahweh's great mercy to Hezekiah, he didn't acknowledge Yahweh as he should have, verse 25. But Hezekiah didn't reciprocate appropriate to the benefit done for him because his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was wrath on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for his pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that Yahweh's wrath didn't come on them in the days of Hezekiah. Comment in verse 26, Hezekiah repented for his pride and lack of appreciation. Coming up, during his life, Yahweh blessed him in the following ways, which are more impressive considering Judah was collapsing when he took the throne. Verse 27, Hezekiah had exceedingly much riches and honor. He provided himself with treasuries for silver, for gold, for precious stones, for spices, for shields, and for all kinds of valuable vessels, also storehouses for the increase of grain, new wine, and oil, and stalls for all kinds of animals, and flocks in folds, Moreover, he provided for himself cities and possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him abundant possessions. This same Hezekiah also stopped the upper spring of the waters of Gihon and brought them straight down on the west side of David's city. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. Comment. After Yahweh slaughtered 185,000 Assyrian soldiers which forced Assyria to withdraw, word of it spread about 900 miles to Babylon in Mesopotamia, the capital city of the Babylonian kingdom. The king of Babylon must have loved it that Hezekiah had embarrassed the Assyrians because we know from secular history the Assyrians were his neighbors and enemies at this time. We know from 2 Kings 20 that the king of Babylon sent ambassadors to Hezekiah to congratulate him and to, quote, inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, end quote. When the ambassadors arrived in Jerusalem, Hezekiah gave them a tour of all his wealth. It was ironic, as Yahweh pointed out to Hezekiah, because in a few generations the Babylonians would invade Judah and take all that wealth. Coming now, just a passing mention of that incident, verse 31. However, concerning the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him that he might know all that was in his heart. Come in, while the ambassadors were there, God left Hezekiah to try him. In other words, Yahweh let him say whatever he wanted to say, and he said too much. In about a hundred years, the Babylonians would come and take whatever was left of that wealth that he put on display. Verse 32. Now the rest of the acts of Hezekiah and his good deeds, behold, they're written in the vision of Isaiah, the prophet, the son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. Hezekiah slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the ascent of the tombs of the sons of David. All Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him at his death. Manasseh, his son, reigned in his place. Comment. It turned out that in the extra 15 years that God gave Hezekiah, he epically embarrassed himself a couple of times. He was prideful, not thankful enough, braggadocious, which put his children and kingdom at risk in the days that would follow. Second Chronicles 33 is next.